We're coming to an area here where we don't have any of the replicas left from the old manufacturing procedures. This whole thing was the dye house. It was always open. It always leaked. You'd think it'd be cold on a winter morning, but they started the boilers up an hour before and this whole thing was full of steam. You walked around here fairly comfortable because it was warm and steamy and wet the whole time. I knew all of those folks. Only two of them in that, in that whole picture I can't name. And the old guy, Walter Reed, the heavy set old man, was a fellow that worked about an hour a day and we paid him eight hours for what he knew. He figured all the formulas for dying. We had an interesting thing here. My early came, we were dying from, from cochineal bugs, actually a little insect that you ground up and died with it, but gave you a kind of a crimson color. We were using indigo, which is a blue plant. Uh, we were using almost all dye stuffs manufactured in Germany by the IG Farben Company when the war broke out and the Farben Company dyes were no longer uh, available. They had been such a dominant force in the manufacturing market that even, uh, uh, even DuPont hadn't developed a dye stuff that we could use satisfactorily. In any event, the dye stuff companies were not with our formulas, and they had to be reformulated by trial and error to get the, the shades that we want. These are day workers, and uh, uh, they made about 30 cents an hour in those days, which was probably pretty consistent with the hourly labor of everybody in the mill. All, all of these guys I remember, this is Ira Rundle, and that's Clarence Jancy, and that's Archie Boyles. They moved at a certain lethargic pace and stirred up the dye stuffs in the manner that they were detected, but they weren't chemists. We only had, you, you introduced the dye stuff with a special kind of a bucket that would only release the dye so much. And it had to be diluted a couple of times, a very small amount into larger amounts into copper kettles. Uh, copper didn't react to the dye stuff. And finally, when they had the large one, you could un un open a spigot at the bottom and the dye stuff would go into there in a very slow fashion so it wouldn't, fa wouldn't fasten itself all at once to one batch of wool and leave the rest undone. A very primitive thing, but we did that for heaven's sakes until the mill closed. Another problem probably today, as I've mentioned, after we had finished dyeing, the mill race would run red or green or yellow or whatever it was that we were running that day. And by the time it got down to the paper mill where they had some application for it, they were as mad as hell. A very unreasonable bunch of those paper mill guys. <laughs> but then they polluted the mill race on the other side, full of sulfur, and by the time it got to the Willamette River and you multiplied that by four or five people up the river all the way to Eugene, it's no wonder that it was time that we took a little ecological look at the health of the river. And as a consequence, we couldn't operate this mill on standards that people use today.